Before we begin this evening, we do have a public hearing. Um, so at this time, it's 7 o'clock, I will open the public hearing for the ordinance relating to quick claim deed for uh, an alley in the uh, historic Leesville district. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this uh, quick claim deed uh, ordinance? Okay, if there are none, uh, I will close the public hearing. And at this time, I'd like to call our regular council meeting uh, to order for the town of Batesburg, Leesville. Welcome, everyone. It is February the 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, and uh, welcome to Town Hall Complex for your Valentine's. Um, at this time, Kent Suits, if you would please lead us in an invocation. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, men and women of the council, for allowing me to be here. My prayer is going to be guided this evening by Romans 11, verses 33 to 36. Pray with me. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are your judgments and how inscrutable are your ways, O oh Lord. Who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things... To you, O oh Lord, be glory forever. Lord, we pray that glory would be due to you tonight, that the conversations, the decisions, the planning of this meeting and other meetings regarding our town would bring you glory, and that you would give wisdom, share some of the wisdom and knowledge of you with the men and women of this leadership. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Pledge of Allegiance. Led by Mr. Gambrel. I pledge allegiance to the two flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. I have the approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Mr. Prowse, a second by Mr. Gambrell. Any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? Yes. 4? Yes. 5? Or 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. Uh, yes. The motion is approved. Item 5 is adoption of the minutes. Let me get on the mic here. Adoption of the minutes of the regular council meeting. This is from January. 10th, 2022, do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Mr. Prouse, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Hall, any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? District 3 votes yes. 4? Yes. 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. How about yes? Motion passes. Adoption of the minutes from the council work session on January 26, 2022. Do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Mr. Hall, do I have a second? Second, Mr. Gambrell. Any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? District 3, both yes. 4? Yes. 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. And I vote yes. Motion passes. Adoption of the minutes from a special council meeting on February the 6th, 2022. Do I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Mr. Gambrell, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Wise? Any discussion? District 1? Yes. Two? Yes. Three? District three votes yes. Four? Yes. Six? Yes. Seven? Yes. Eight? Yes. No, oh, yes. The motion passes. Item six is the mayor's report. Our next regular council meeting is going to be on March 14th, 2022. And for council committee's report, Central Midlands COD, Council Member Hall. Central Midlands Council Government Board of Directors met on January 27th. It was a Zoom meeting. The chairman declared the quorum was present. The consent agenda was approved without discussion. Of interest was the approval of, to the Eastover expansion of their wastewater treatment facility to 1.2 million gallons, which was approved, and discussion of the financial compliance report, which noted significant area in the starting balance. Um, there is a full agenda in your packet. Thank you, Mr. Hall. EPAC, Councilmember Prouse, EPAC. EPAC did meet in the month of January. Um, I think that was our first time in a year. 
Um, and we had uh, one item uh, we focused on. It was uh, a 208 plan amendment to uh, expand the East Over Wastewater Treatment Plant um, capacity to 1.2 million gallons per day. Um, discussion was had uh, and um, discussion related to the fact that there wasn't there would be no additional outflows um, from the plant, uh, just an expansion of their capacity. Uh, and uh, the committee did vote to send um, to recommend that uh, approval to the COB. That's all. Thank you, sir. Comment Advisory Committee, Councilmember Kane. So the comment uh, event, and as you guys know, we, we several times throughout the month through our committees and then also um, in our general meeting, and I could be here all night and give you an update on, on the comment. But um, we, we're working on our budget. We've had uh, several employees recognized in the media for outstanding uh, service. And I also want to let you all know that uh, the Lexington County members of that, uh, of that board are non-voting members, and which is something that it is written, we're not voting because we don't pay. <laughs> we don't pay. So um, our our participation is um, is generally you know pretty much uh, advisory. But uh, hopefully Ted is going to be working on um, that Route 97. I think we we spent a lot of work on that. We got the bus stops out there, and so now we need to be moving. Council our council needs to be moving forward with um, ways to uh, to fund that route so that we can have a voting uh, uh, voice on that on that committee. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, Joint Municipal Water and Sewer Commission did meet last week. Um, they had their annual audit. It was a uh, solid, uh, positive audit in a solid year end uh, financial, financially uh, for the commission. Uh, capital projects continue with the team <coughs> behind uh, Publix. Also, a lot of support uh, for commission members, um, Pillion, Red Bank, uh, Swansea. Um, employees were also recognized for 20 years of service and a uh, glowing review for the general manager uh, over at Joint Municipal. And next up would be BL Chamber of Commerce President, Mr. Mike Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council, and may I say happy Valentine's Day to each of you. Um, the Bank for Relief the Chamber of Commerce and Business Center presented their request at the Accommodation Tax Committee uh, on February the 2nd. We have been informed that, uh, that that has been approved, and of course they'll go before County Council for their approval in the budget process. I attended two meetings with South Carolina Chamber of Commerce, one virtually and one at their uh, headquarters. Um, virtually was strictly uh, legislative updates and so forth. The one at the uh, uh, South Carolina Chamber of Commerce was an update on that, but it was also a presentation by Major General Grimms, who's uh, South Carolina Secretary of Veteran Affairs. And he kind of gave an overview of where we stand, and uh, he is uh, very knowledgeable and I think will do an outstanding job. Also, we had a uh, presentation by Steve Padgett uh, of Blue Cross Blue Shield. And the reason I'm bringing that up, I don't know whether you're aware or not, but the Chamber of Commerce of South Carolina have an opportunity to offer health insurance. They have like two categories, from two to 50 employees and 51 to 100. We have several businesses in the community that have taken advantage of the big one, but they have restructured the two to uh, 50 and offer 38 various plans for smaller businesses, which I hope that that will give them some affordable uh, health insurance in the community and benefit our small businesses. Uh, Arts on the Ridge uh, met. Uh, we hope to have the theatrical camp in the summer, but what we're waiting on is to see the, what the uh, school district decides to plan for that age group during the summer because we're falling behind a little bit during uh, COVID and also the summer literacy program at Faith Lutheran. Um, but we do plan to hold our event uh, in October of, of this year like we did this past year and maybe some other events throughout the year. Uh, our first fundraising uh, event will be Saturday, March the 19th at TNS Farm. Uh, that, we're, we're bringing back Taste of the Town. I think last time we had that was in 2014. Uh, we had it at the chamber for about five or six years and before that, 
PM homemakers had, so it kind of run its course. But I think now is a good time to bring that back. It's a great opportunity for people to get out and enjoy themselves. Um, they are, we'll have about 15 uh, individuals or businesses that will come and share their, their best recipe for those to have a good evening. Um, more information will come about that just a little bit later. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, if there are not any questions. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mike, what is, what is going on with the uh, Midwest Technical College? Well, sir, there's... Are there students out there? they got kids. they offering classes here? They are not students there right now, no, sir. Are they offering classes there? They are, they are looking into offering classes, okay? But they are, they are, there's uh, some committees for them to study as uh, far as um, the older people coming in, not your students from, like, going from the first or second a year of, of college, no sir, not right now. Okay. And what about the uh, Dream Catchers program? Dream Catchers program, we're trying to find some leadership in that. Uh, Susan Little was instrumental in that, we lost that, her, and then the other person took over that is uh, she's uh, taking another job or additional jobs and that's not, uh, she's not available. So we're find, trying to find some leadership in that through the chamber, yes sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Yes, sir. The next item up is a public comment regarding items on the agenda. I do have one person signed up. Section 1313, Appearance of Citizens. Any citizen of the municipality may address council at any regular council meeting. Discussion is limited to items on the current agenda. Those who request to speak must sign in with the municipal clerk, clerk no later than 10 minutes prior to the beginning of the regular meeting, indicating their name, address, and agenda on which they intend to to comment. Um, each person who gives notice may speak at a designated time and will be limited to a three-minute presentation at the discretion of the presiding officer. No question shall be entertained. This is not a forum for debate. Individual council members and the mayor may, may be directly addressed before or after each meeting. The presiding officer may limit the number of speakers. One speaker may not defer his or her a lot of time to another speaker. See me, I have Mr. Steve King. Today I'm addressing our executive session for tonight, and my concern is that one, we don't we are addressing the contract that no one sitting up there has seen. Okay, and then we are have scheduled a vote on that contract that nobody's seen, and the implications of that contract is that we could very well uh, raise water bills. Um, to a level that we that we are not aware of. Okay, nobody's seen it. Um, it could raise your water bill. We already raised the uh, the uh, property tax. So we're looking at raising water bills to uh, percentage that no one knows. Nobody's ready. We have two other viable options for uh, for water in our community, and we really need to take a look at that. And I know we're not supposed to uh, have any questions tonight, but the if anybody on that council knows how much per thousand dollars um, this new contract would cost, you know, I'd buy you dinner. But my point is, uh, in addressing council on this uh, platform, is that we we don't know what's in that contract. Nobody's ready. You know, there's no way you can go back in that executive session for uh, five, ten minutes go over a 50-page contract that obligates the town up to $20 million without reading. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. New business, uh, item 9, a presentation of the fiscal year 2020-2021 financial audit by McGregor and Company. Mr. Mayor, if we could, we have one item under. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped. Thank you. Reading glasses. Uh, we have one item, sorry, Henry, uh, unfinished business. This is a uh, second reading of the ordinance relating to a quick claim deed for uh, the alley over in the historic Leesville district. And 
then <coughs> recommending to council approve the second reading of the ordinance to quick claim deed the attached reference to the alley uh, to JB Group LLC. This was included in your packet. Do I have a do I have a motion? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Props? I move that we um, adopt the ordinance as presented in the packet. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Wise? Any discussion? Mr. Mayor, may I point out that Mr. Hall? there was a change in this ordinance between first and second reading. The original reading of the ordinance specified that it was to be transferred to Mr. Brent Sheely. The second reading says that it will be transferred to an entity. And I would, I would, the, first, uh, the first reading said Brent Sheely or his designee. I received a letter from his attorney saying that his designee was J.B. Cooper. That's a change. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion? Does that, did that change? Any, Mr. Kane? Chris, does that change require us to do anything in second reading? No. Thank you. Any other discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? District 3 votes yes. 4? Yes. 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. And I vote yes. Motion passes. Now, new business. Thank you. <laughs> Presentation of the fiscal year 2020-2021 financial audit <coughs> by McGregor and Company. Mr. Luckett, if you would introduce our guest, please. Sure. Tonight we have Mr. Neil Kreider here. Uh, he presented last year as well. Um, he is the lead guy for our town's financial audit. Um, so he is here tonight to present their findings. Well, appreciate you being here. All right. Thank you, Mr. Luckett. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for having me tonight. It's happy Valentine's Day. So I need to make this quick so I can get my butt home. <laughs> All right, well, I hope everybody's doing well. It's a pleasure to be here, like I say. Um, I want to thank management and staff for uh, assisting us this year with all our inquiries and providing us all the information we needed. We had this little room over here full. All right, let's get right to it. On page one and two, Right after the table of contents, you will find our report on the financial statements. First paragraph reports what was audited and for what period. Second paragraph explains the town's responsibilities regarding these financial statements. And the third paragraph states our responsibility as, as your auditor, which is to express opinions on these financial statements based on our audit. We conducted that audit in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. And those standards require that we plan to perform the audit to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement. And we believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our audit opinions. So in our opinion, these financial statements are presented fairly in all material respects. Therefore, we issue an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion on the financial statements. Now, if you'll please turn to page 71 and 72, there's another independent auditor's report back there. So this, this is a report on internal control. So when speaking of internal control deficiencies, there are two types that reach the level of reportable findings that will be written in this document. And they are significant deficiencies and material weaknesses. Significant deficiencies are the less severe finding, while material weaknesses report a reasonable possibility that a material misstatement will not be prevented or detected and corrected on a timely basis. In prior year, we noted four material weaknesses in internal control. They were all corrected in a timely fashion by management, and they were not repeated in the current year. And we also did not note any new findings in the current year. Therefore, no findings are reported for fiscal year 21. All right. Let's cover a little bit of financial highlights here. I'm trying to move uh, quickly through this. All right, page 9 and 10 of the financials. 
Give me a minute to get there. Okay, so 9 and 10. These statements are referred to as government-wide financial statements. They are presented on the full accrual basis, essentially capturing all your capital assets, accounts receivable, deferred outflows of resources, capital lease obligations, general obligation bond debt, revenue bond debt, pension liabilities, and other post-employment benefit obligations and deferred inflows of resources. So this is the big picture of the town. This statement has a column for governmental activities and business type activities. Business type activities represents your utility fund. And the governmental activities represents everything else, uh, including the general fund, hospitality tax fund, and the victim's assistance fund. Net position, uh, which represents essentially the net worth of the town, if you will, was 2,405,586 for governmental activities and 11,365,661 for business type activities. The governmental activities increased by 611,783 from prior year, and business type activities increased 726,532 from prior year. These are healthy numbers for the town, and a positive net position is a wonderful thing considering net position liabilities of 6,271,622. Many governments are showing deficits here, so it's good that you're showing positive numbers. Okay, let's flip over to page 13. This statement shows the activity in the town's major funds, including the general fund and the hospitality tax fund, as well as a column for other governmental funds, which is made up of solely the victim's assistance fund. Uh, the general fund had revenues of four million eight nineteen nine sixty seven and expenses of four million six twenty five four twenty six, leaving an excess of one ninety four five forty one. Then there were transfers from other funds, twenty thousand seven hundred from hospitality, sixty five eight sixty nine from the utility fund, and then you also had the lease proceeds of four fifty this year. This. This resulted in an increase to general fund balance of 731,110, bringing total general fund balance at June 30, 21, to 2,315,444. Four. So this is roughly six months of operating space, which is very helpful. If you flip to page 48. You will see those same numbers compared to the budget. The town had 290,875 more expenditures than budgeted, but also had 604,467 more revenues than budgeted. So bottom line is the general fund netted an increase of 731.10. Sir? Yes? What, what accounted for that, uh, that increase in revenue? Let's see, a lot of, a lot of that was, uh, we had about 38.5 uh, business license. You had a uh, receivable from your MASC, Municipal Association, that increased 150,000 there at the year, end of the year. Um, you had, overall, you had about 100,000 more come from that agency as well over last year. Uh, so that was a bulk of the increase in the revenue side. On the revenue side, didn't we show 299000 as residual from a loan? Residual from a loan? Yeah, a $450,000 uh, that we borrowed to buy yes. police cars. That's $299,000. Yes. That's, That's correct. That. Plus, yeah. we transferred money out of uh, hospitality tax and we transferred money uh, out of the uh, biz, uh, the. Uh, yeah other fund mm -hmm. so that would account for we had also the ending from my reading the ending of our grant for the fire department uh, will end and go from to come out of general revenues but, but just making sure I understand that yeah yeah I've got a note further along here thank you 
But yeah, he's got a very good point. That, you know, we'll go ahead and address that now. The 450, we didn't spend it all up through 2021. But you don't show it as a deferred liability. Right. So yeah, not in the modified. Because the rule was for a specific purpose. So right. therefore, when you calculated the six and a half months worth of uh, monies available, uh, that may be skewed slightly. Yes, and, and I'm going to get to that further. further back. Thank you. Okay. But yeah, because I, I do want you to understand that next year it's going to have the, the seesaw effect to. Well, that's Mr. That, King. That was partly that was partly the reason for the for the question. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, no. Go ahead and finish it. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, well, no, these are very good questions. Okay. Very good questions. Yeah. And I like, I like, yeah. I like, yeah, because some, sometimes you get You know, we want to get you home to the doctor. <coughs> okay. So, so, some people don't ask, ask questions and it makes me nervous. So. Okay. Well, we're going to ask you. All right. Let's see. Let me find out where it is. All right. So we're going to pay for these. Okay. I'm sorry, you had you were at the point that you were saying seven hundred and eighty eight thousand increase. I'm sorry? You were at the point that you said we had a seven hundred thousand dollar increase. That's right. Okay. It's seven thirty one. I think this thing will turn there. But you did not get better you have to go. I can talk to you louder unless you need it before I'll talk about that. I don't need that. There goes the budget. <laughs> All right, flip one page over to 49. This is your hospitality tax fund. It's showing the figures there compared to what you budgeted. 624306 was received, $689,978 was spent. Um, the 20700 transferred out to the general fund for landscaping services provided by that fund. So the net decrease of 86372 however, 517,268 remained in that fund balance at year end. All that for future projects as y'all see fit. All right, let's flip back to 15. Drop it back and forth. Not going to help it make sense to you. Pages 15 through 19, this is where you'll find the utility fund. This is your your business fund. So it's going to have your statements of net position, statements of revenues, expenses, changes in fund net position, and your cash flow statement. So the utility fund had an increase in net position of 726,532, bringing your total net position there to 11,365,661. And the fund, uh, utility fund, had an increase in cash assets. Of two eighty five nine twenty eight. All right. A few more quick highlights, and I'll be done. Debt down the town paid down thirty five thousand three twenty nine in principal on its geo bonds, and paid down one hundred eighty five thousand on its revenue bonds. The geo bonds and the revenue bonds will be paid off scheduled in twenty twenty five. The 2015 lease purchase was paid off during the year, and the town entered into the $450,000 lease purchase agreement during fiscal year 2021. $215,970 in equipment was purchased with these lease proceeds during fiscal year 21, and the remaining should be fully spent out in 2022. Since the town was obligated to the 450, during the year, the full amount was recognized as lease proceeds. However, only 215970 was spent. So the fund balance was essentially higher by 234.030 in fiscal year 21 and will be lower by that amount in 2022 due to the timing of the expenditure. So everybody, everybody good there that we're going to be spending about that much more than we are showing. So this year, our, our fund balance is a little inflated, but it's going to work out over the two years. Okay, looking ahead to fiscal year 22, and we're almost, we're, we're well over half. If the town reaches 
the threshold is $750,000 in federal expenditures in a single fiscal year is going to trigger, trigger a single audit. So obviously we've got the American Rescue Plan dollars. Uh, it's very possible the town to reset thresholds just for that, uh, depending on how much is obligated and spent. And, and then that also means that the other federal dollars that the town receives will become subject to that audit. Um, so we'll, we're going to have to look at that and see. I imagine we may have. I'm not sure yet. Probably for 2022 budget, our audit, <clears throat> we will not have spent the 750, but likely in 23 we will. Okay. We'll, we'll definitely check on that there at the end of the year to make sure because it's very important we do not miss having to do that. But I'm qualified to perform those type of audits. <coughs> without missing a beat, and we'll make the uh, appropriate submissions if they are necessary. So, any questions? Yes, sir. We Mr. have Hall? a uh, 38, uh, I'm sorry. No, sorry, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yep. We show a $38,000 tax abatement obligation in the report. Mm -hmm. Is that, what is that uh, can, concern? Can you show me which, uh, which uh, uh, it's buried. I read it uh, last night. We have a tax abatement. To oh, okay. I got I'm not familiar with the term. Yes, sir. Okay, this, this is a new standard that came out not too long ago where if there are any agreements entered into at the county level where they are offering tax abatements, the county is required to, to provide information to municipalities and anybody affected by those. So if there's a reduction at the county level where those taxes are reduced on what you normally would receive, they have to report that information to you to include in your financials so you can let your readers know how much it, it affected the town. That's essentially what that is. So that's part of that disclosure in note 13 on page 46. So that's true paper dollars that uh, essentially we did not get because there was a tax incentive for the industrial park. That's right. right. The other one is uh, deferred uh, liability for a retirement program. Numbers are massive, uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Uh, okay. But that's, uh, let's see. that's a new reporting requirement. I want to make sure I'm on the right number and the right uh, item you're talking about. I should have written page numbers down. Now, Mr. Hall has the floor, please. Uh, deferred expenses, I guess it's in the area of number 40. Page 40. Would it be page 41? pension program and we pay 15% for some employees, 17.9% mm -hmm. for others, but then it says that we could have a liability of $232,000 or whatever. Uh, is that a... Well, actually, for pension, your liability is way larger than that. Now, let me see if I can find uh, this. Uh, these are actually deferred outflows resources and deferred inflows resources. Yes. All this information in this note is generated by the actuaries um, for the South Carolina Retirement System and the Police Retirement System. The state will hire those actuaries to come in and, and generate all these numbers, and we essentially are taking those numbers and putting those in, and it's, it's based on the allocation of your contributions into those, each of those individual systems. So there's a percentage, and, the, and this note details all of that. But when you're talking about your pension liability overall, 
you are you're looking at uh, <clears throat> pension liability for just say your let's say overall utility fund the entire town you're looking at six million two seventy one. So if the retirement system just belly up bankrupt, then essentially what they're trying to say is that will be the town's portion of that. And, and if you've noticed, retirement is going up rapidly, 1% every year. They put a pause on that with COVID, but they're essentially trying to get to a certain level to fund that liability so that it continues to drop. Um, so they so they can, because uh, it's just been going on forever. And Mr. Crowder, if you would correct me if I'm wrong, the state used to carry that liability on their books but I believe it was about three or four years ago they decided they wanted to get it off of their books and they wanted each individual county and municipality to carry that liability on their books for auditing purposes. Is that correct? Essentially that's correct. If it was on their book to begin with. But, uh, but you know, that, that, was, uh, that was the goal is to spread it out to everybody else. One last one. In your audit uh, procedure, you're looking at safeguards to assure that there's no financial misdeeds, which I'm sure there wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. But do you also look at uh, our procurement uh, ordinance to make sure that we comply with that system? Yes, sir. Yes, we, we look at that, and what we what we do is draw a sample. So essentially, we are we're taking a bucket, dipping it in a swimming pool, and testing that bucket to see if there's any. To include signature authorities? Oh, yes. Does our ordinance not specify a $1,000 limit uh, before it comes to council in some situations? I don't want to call them that to say. I've got multiple different. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'll have to go back and we'll discuss it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Have a great well done day. Do you have your card? Is your card in here? At this time, I'd like a motion from council um, to accept the audit. So moved. Mr. Hall, do I have a second? Second. Uh, uh, I think I heard Mr. Gambro. Any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. Three. District three votes yes. Four. Yes. Six. Yes. Seven. Yes. Eight. Yes. Uh, well, yes. Uh, motion passes. Thank you very much. Does anybody need to hang around? I think you're good. We'll contact you if you have questions. Uh, go home with your wife. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, have a happy Valentine's Day. Uh, item B is a resolution uh, adopting the Central Midlands All Natural Risk Assessment, assessment and Mitigation Plan. Um, this was in the packet. Um, you have a motion to adopt. Again, adopting the Central Midlands All Natural Risk Assessment and Mitigation Plan. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt the plan. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Krause, any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? District 3 votes yes. 4? Yes. 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. Uh, yes. Resolution is passed. Motion passed. Um, next is a first reading ordinance for a multi county industrial park designation for Batesburg, Leesville, and Industrial Park. Um, this was also presented. Uh, very well in the packet. Thank you for that. And um, entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. The first reading. Mr. Prowse. I move that we approve the first reading of this ordinance as presented in the packet. Thank you, Mr. Prowse. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Mr. Wise. Any discussion? Yes, sir, can you explain Mr. Gain? About what, what the, uh... Sure. Um, so in the past, um, the one of the things the county has done for all of their industrial parks is establish them, uh, establish multi-county industrial park designations for for those. 
I, I explain in more detail in the white paper what a multi-county industrial well, park is. We have a guess here, and some people are, <coughs> are privy to it. That's right. That's the question. Um, so parcel number 13, um, I think it's been out there, Capital Concrete is looking to come into the industrial park. Uh, just as we did with C.R. Jackson, um, we've been asked to establish a multi-county industrial park designation for the Capital Concrete project on parcel number 13 in the park. Um, so if I, if you want me to just read off what, what this states, this is, um, this is basically what has to be there to allow the fee in lieu of tax and sales, <coughs> um, to be able to offer those to attract industry into the industrial parks. They have chosen Calhoun County as their partner county for the multi-county industrial park designation, which is a requirement by law as well. Um, that they choose another county who brings in less money. So they chose Cowan County. Um, obviously, as an incentive, they want to be able to offer a fee in lieu of tax to get these industries into park, and that's where the multi-county industrial park designation comes in. Right, but now, we, when the army that we're talking about, the um, tax abatement, mm -hmm. right, it, that is basically the incentive to get the companies to come to the industrial park, right? Not necessarily, um, and I can, but the fee in lieu and the tax of bait. No, 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 I'm talking about when he was, he, the, he meant not the fee in lieu. <laughs> I'm talking about the tax abatement is something that, that they use as in, to incentivize the uh, industrial park, right? I am not 100%. There are several different ways you can tax abatement. If you take over an old building that's been unused for a certain number of years, there's a tax abatement for property taxes. Right. That's different than, than this. Well, I understand. I'm not trying to conflate the two and say that they're two the same things, but um, that, that, that's not, that, that was not my point, that they were they were the same thing. But he mentioned the abatement, and you were talking about incentive to come to the, to the industrial park. But my uh, question would be, now the concrete company that is coming, potentially, Right? How many local jobs are they going to create? I believe it was up to 10 new positions. From local folks? You have opportunities for that? Some, some may be brought in and some may be local. I'm not 100% what they're planning. The, the last company that came, the asphalt company, how many people have they hired? At this point, they're still in construction, so I don't know what they have hired at this point. Okay. But for, for the most part, you're talking about the industrial park generating maybe five local jobs, maybe in total, something like that. So, how does this um, uh, this agreement work as far as encouraging um, job creation in that industrial park? We we can be a multi-county designee, but what what's the benefit to the town for doing that? Well, certainly a piece of property undeveloped versus a piece of property developed is going to increase your tax revenue. So we're going to get increased taxes from that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I think five or ten jobs is better than no jobs created in our town. Well, it may not be 150 or 1,000 new jobs that some others do, but five or ten is better than zero. Well, um, if the, if, like you said, you can't even guarantee the 5 or 10 because they may be bringing people with them. Well, and that's speculation at this point. I can't right. say they're not, they are or can't say they aren't. But right. you certainly get business license revenue. I mean, there are multiple ways that it's beneficial to have these industries coming in than to not have them come in. I understand that. And I guess my uh, encouragement to you is that um, we probably need to be looking for a bigger fish so we can get more bang for our buck because what's going to happen in that industrial park is that it's going to fill up with these little companies like this and they're not bringing any jobs into into the town. They, they bring in you know, a few dollars for uh, taxes, but they're not bringing any, any real jobs for the people. I don't disagree that I would like to see a nice large industry come into well, the industrial park. Well, well, you can have a nice little mayor, if I might. Mr. Hall. Yes, Mr. Hall, floor. I, I understand that we actually have delegated the recruitment to.
to the Lexington County Development, Ms. Johnson? I don't believe we delegated them. They own the park. They own the park, right. so therefore they're doing Correct. the recruitment. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. So, thank you. No, Mr. K? No, <laughs> that's, that's it. Okay, any other discussion on this? So again, this is the first reading for the ordinance for multi-county industrial park designation for Batesburg Leesville Industrial Park. Um, as presented in the packet and discussed uh, by Mr. Luckett. District 1? Yes. District 2? Yes. District 3? District 3 votes yes. District 4? Yes. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. District 8? Yes. And I vote yes. Motion passes. New business continued. Item D. Council approval appointments to planning and boarding, boarding, uh, planning and board of zoning appeals. Uh, appeals. Man, that Missouri accent. Councilman Steve Gaines recommended the reappointment of Jennifer Edwards to the Planning Commission. He has also recommended the reappointment of Shirley Barr to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Both have been serving and have agreed to continue serving. Councilwoman Shirley Mitchell has recommended the reappointment of Ms. Ethel Etheridge to the Board of Zoning Appeals. She has been serving and has agreed to continue serving. Uh, do I have a motion uh, to, to no. accept? Hold on one second, Mr. Kane. Do I have a motion to accept all? Mr. Mayor. I have a motion by Mr. Gambro. Second. Second by Mr. Pross. Now, any discussion? Didn't she Mr. Kane? Did we approve her other appointment already? We did. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? District 3 votes yes. 4? Yes. 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Motion passed. And that brings us to item 10, which is the manager's report. Mr. Luckadoo. I believe we're going to start out tonight. I would ask our representative, Cal Forrest, if he would come up front, please. Hey, Cal. I'm very glad that you had to sit through all this because of all the <laughs> times I sat through the general session. <laughs> Welcome, Cal. South Carolina High School. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Cal. Thank you. Happy Mayor and ladies and gentlemen of the council. And uh, I, I want to address a personal personnel matter you have in uh, with your Batesburg Lisbon Police Department. And if I can get Chief Oswald to come up here, it will probably be very helpful. And uh, someone want to grab his cane? <laughs> He's, He's actually part of the problem. Yeah. I've got very yeah. good news and very bad news to bring to everybody. Is that, here old, is that an old joke? <laughs> no, 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 sir. <laughs> Not with this gray hair. Yeah, I've known cows since he was born. <laughs> but he, uh, I guess that's an old joke. <laughs> Very much so. But uh, as y'all know, he was South Carolina Law Enforcement Officer Association. Um, he, he won a Lifetime Achievement Award recently, uh, back in November, I believe it was. And uh, I've got a whole list of all kind of awards that uh, Chief Oswald has earned over the years. And uh, it's just my pleasure to come up here and congratulate him. And upon his retirement coming up a little bit too soon for all of us on June 30th. and. Uh, you know, as he says, he's known me all my life, and uh, I've never known another chief of uh, Batesburg, and then we, we merged towns, chief of Batesburg, Leesville, and whoever y'all decide is going to be Chief Oswald's replacement. Um, I'm not, you, you can get the best uh, law enforcement officer in the land, and they would not do the same job as this guy does, because he grew up here, and I'm not, I shouldn't say how many years, I shouldn't say how many years he's done it, but I think it's, it starts with a four in <laughs> six, 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 46 years. There's no way that you can uh, be taught that type of intimate knowledge of those uh, inner workings of a town like Baseball and Leesville. And uh, so I'm sure that whoever y'all here will do a good job, but um, nobody's going to be able to fill these, this guy's shoes for a long time. And I just want to congratulate you for the House resolution. And uh, we appreciate you so much. Next item up, Mr. Luckadoo. We have the BOPD end of year report for 2021. Uh, Chief Wallace Oswald. Or the old age. 
great job getting a reading class. <laughs> I put a copy of the report at all of your stations to go on with the slides. If I can work this thing. There's something on the screen that you need to have to I don't know. He's the laptop guy. Might have timed out. It's been up there so long. before we start. slide because it would be too small uh, to put it on the slide. If you turn the page over for the, the bar graph, you'll see this report that's not on the slide. Uh, what this is, is I've highlighted the ones that did go up uh, so you can see uh, which, which uh, reports on which crimes or which, what reports went up during the year. As you, uh, you can see, some went up for just a few uh, and some went up quite a bit. As you see about middle of the front page on drug crimes, that was the biggest increase that we had 21, over 20 uh, were the drug increase of crime, crimes and drugs. Uh, I, part of that is uh, our great work from, we have a, a Lieutenant uh, Nimmons that works on the multi-jurisdictional task force, and he has done a great job of, of doing, uh, working these drug cases that we have, along working with our uniform officers who of course out there and see things and report it to him and he works on it. So that's been great. Just leave it, you can leave through and that was the biggest problem with the drug, but the others increased some. Uh, the family offense is nonviolent. On the second page, you see that increased quite a bit. It works now. That increased quite a bit. That would be family disputes if we get called on. Uh, and that was a big increase. But along with runaways that's right below it, we also increased on that one. So you can see the numbers uh, that go along with the bar graph that are that you have presented to you behind the bar graph on, on your sheet. Chief, if, you might, if I might, yes, uh, on the first page on the graph, the rate forcible from zero to seven significant increase, is that a single individual or? No. Mm -hmm. it, it was different ones around town, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I failed to see that one to highlight it. When I was going over, I didn't see that one. Now that could be not on, uh, it could be also on, that could be uh, attempted because they don't separate. Okay, next are the accident reports. Uh, you can see accidents went up a, a little bit from 2020 to 21, uh, 2002 and 20, and 2009 and 21. The second slide is a little hard to see. You flip it over and you pack it. This gives a, uh, a dot for each one of those 209 accidents. Now, as you could probably predict, and anyone could pr predict, even though the, the uh, map is small and it's hard to see, but most of them are on on the, the main roads of number one and 23 highway through town, the majority of them. Some spread out to other areas and other streets, uh, but that gives you kind of an idea of what part of town uh, the main part of the acts or majority of the acts is. Uh, if you wish to talk to your representatives, Kyle left it. Yeah. Uh, to the town manager and assistant town manager, and I have been talking a lot about this intersection below us here with a Starbucks opening uh, somewhere down the line. Uh, we're assuming uh, uh, 
cookout wheel because they bought the uh, Burger King. Uh, that's going to be a mess at that intersection. We already have some accidents there, and they will increase. I mean, it's almost a gimmick with all those businesses at that intersection. They will. Uh, same reason, too. Uh, don't know why it is. There's no businesses there. But I know the accidents. We work at the intersection of, uh, uh, of E Street or Palm Branch Highway, as most of us know it, and Number One Highway. We have a lot of breaks there. There's no business there. We really don't know why, but we do. Uh, we, we have a lot of access there. What about North Carolina Avenue? What we don't really have a lot of access there. No. It's a lot of traffic. It's a lot of traffic, but I guess because of that, people are watching out for it. You know? So we don't really have a lot of access in North Carolina. Uh, but uh, this one down here at Starbucks, and like I said, as far as we're not having a lot of them there, we're having a few with people pulling out in front of people on 23 Highway. We're having a few. Is this where they merge or at the light? I mean, there's no light. No light, but is it the merge one or is it? No, it's people, pull, it's people pulling out from the, uh, the the stores pulling into 23 is where the accidents used to happen. I guess they're getting impatient and pulling and trying to beat about trying to beat the traffic to get out, and that's usually where they come from. But the uh, I, when I talked the last time I talked to spoke to the lady about Palm Branch and Number One. She, she was looking at satellites. She said, I don't know why you're having an accident. I said, I don't know either, but we are. Uh, that's one of the main contributor to accidents and inter, uh, intersections is that one. Uh, I pr really appreciate the town doing something with uh, Pine Street and or trying to. It's been worked on Pine Street and, uh, and uh, 178 and 391. That has been a nightmare for us for many years. The post, the little post there has helped a lot. Uh, but getting that intersection finished will be a big deal uh, with all those tractor trailers going through there. Uh, that will be. If we could just get the one in Mitchell Street done now uh, like that, that would, that would be great. I don't know if the penny tax will help on that. I know it was on the list before when the penny tax came up at Wendy's. But that, that's a, we need turn lanes there bad at that intersection, real turn lanes. You know you can get a ticket for that, Chief? Yes, we do it all the time. <laughs> I've, I've even issued tickets at that intersection. And I don't write tickets, but I've issued them at that intersection. But you know, most people don't know that you can't. It's got, a, it's got a turn lane, it's got an arrow on the, painted on the road, and there's a sign up top that says right turn only. So you, you, can, you, not, it, you cannot turn, you cannot go into that lane to pass the car that's turning. It's a lot of people get people now. <laughs> it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Okay. Traffic tickets issued, uh, they went up last year from 2020 to 21 from 600 and uh, looks like an 8 to 1,046 last year. Detention facility, uh, we went up uh, from there again too in 2020 from 395 to 461, some increase but not a lot. In our jail, uh, folks, that the, the jail uh, saves us a lot of time on the uh, uh, road going to Lexington County Jail uh, because, uh, like today, Judge Cook came up and said, "Bond on the guy we had in the back." He got out. His attorney came up and got him up here. Uh, Eighty-five percent or better of the ones of these that we house got out here because the judges come up and set bond here, the bond company or whatever, come and get them here, and we're not running up and down the road to Lexington County all the time, uh, all the people up and down the road. Just imagine not 461, every one of them having to be transported to Lexington County. Uh, that would be a lot of time spent on the road that we don't do. Now, is it possible that to give somebody a blue ticket without going through the bond situation? It, on traffic offenses, man, yes. But anything that's a custodial arrest, if we could custodially arrest someone, they have to go for a judge. Okay, okay dispatch calls, uh, you can see uh, they came down a, a little bit. Now, these are not just phone calls that the uh, dispatchers take. This is actually calls that dispatchers dispatch an officer for. Uh, the phone calls of that, especially uh, when the power goes out. Uh, I don't know why I would, uh, I, well, I'm not, I, I would be facetious to say that. I'm not trying to be mean, but uh, people, instead of calling Dominion, they call us and say that they out. I mean, We're not Dominion. I mean, we can, you know. Neither is the mayor. But, but they still call us. Uh, sometimes we have to put two people over on the phone. It's just a handle phone, people calling us when the power's out. Uh, 
house. Are they telling you power was out of the house or in yeah. the street? No. The power in the house. I'll call Ted. Yeah, we call, call, that's right. Call the power manager. Don't call us. Okay, citizens assisted by dispatch, that number, for some reason, when I did it, it's the, the coloring on the numbering on the bar didn't come out well, but it went up again last year. These are the people who actually walk into our lobby uh, during the whole year. Uh, the, it's hard to see it, I know, and I'm sorry, but in 2020, it was uh, 13,280, and then last year, that went up to 18,500. Uh, we get, uh, like I said, we get everything just... Uh, I think it was about a month ago now, uh, a guy came in and had been shot in, in Slough County or Aiken County and he ended up in our, our lobby. You would be surprised how that happens. Uh, people are injured, uh, they come to our lobby, uh, want ambulance. And it happens quite a bit and we get everything. People wanting, people wanting directions is not as much anymore because everyone has that on their phone now. But that's not quite as much. But it used to be that was a big deal. Uh, even UPS drivers would come in our lobby want no direction. But now with the phones, that's kind of stopped that. But we get everything else still in our lobby. Okay, this is the race uh, uh, race, race breakdown of the first one. The first one is our victims of crimes. Uh, these are people who reported crimes, had crimes committed against them. Uh, the African American was 495, uh, Caucasian was 551. Then the, the second, the middle uh, chart, are, is the ones that I just told you about in the jail that was that were actually arrested. Uh, African Americans 203, the Caucasians 258, and then the last one are tickets issued. Uh, this will be your traffic tickets and so forth, non-custodial arrest that we were talking about. The, the African Americans were 392 and the Caucasian was 654. The same breakdown by gender. Uh, and the first one on victims. As you can see, and I think this, uh, I don't know if it speaks for society now or, or what uh, is the, uh, the, the thing now, but as you can see on victims of crime, the male victims were 432, while female victims were 666. Females were a, bit, a lot more victims of crimes than males in this. Then arrest, uh, male victims uh, 323, where female was 142. And then on tickets issued, male tickets 694, where female were 352. Despite what you guys tell your wives all the time, that women are worse drivers than men, as you can see there, men get most tickets. The other thing amazing, Chief, is our demographics. We have 54% females. Men are outnumbered in this community by an 8% margin. Okay, that, I, I just put some pictures for fun. Uh, the first the first picture of the three is National Night Out with SRO Miller handing out candy to the kids. The middle one, uh, well, let me go across to the, uh, that was Field MRAP. Our Field MRAP of Taurus was a great success this year. People gave everything. I mean, there was a lot of stuff for kids we gave out. I think it's like 75 families that we gave toys to this year. Uh, the center on some of the uh, things we gave elderly people in town that needed uh, blankets and uh, space heaters, uh, we, we gave those out. We bought the ceramic heaters, not the kerosene heaters. Uh, so we gave out heaters and blankets on that too. Then this picture, uh, for uh, because of the Freedom uh, Union United Park being built, uh, this was when I we actually, if any of you wondered what happened to the court dockets and the police dockets uh, documents from Sergeant Woodard, uh, this is one where I turned them over to the state archives so they would be permanently stored and wouldn't be lost in Ted's closet somewhere <laughs> or something like that. They, that cannot happen now. They've been turned over to the state archives, so they, they will be preserved forever awesome. on that. That's where I had to get them out of his closet. <laughs> okay, this last one, uh, one of the things, if you noticed in the, uh, December, or no, November, our, our officers got a little bully with the, their shaving. Uh, that was no shave month, and we, we ended up uh, collecting, I forgot now what it was, we did a, a news thing on it. 
but it was several hundred dollars that the house was collected, not shaved that month, and this is when we turned the money over to the National, uh, National Cancer Society uh, for that. We did that. Any questions? Thank you so much, Chief. I think it's fire chief's turn now. Thank you. Thank you. Fire that was your last end of the year report. Exactly. End of year report for 2021, Chief and Josh Fry. Good evening. Good evening. I guess this is not my last one of these to do. No. I've got a few more yet. You never know. <laughs> well, never know. <laughs> <that is true. laughs> I think my last one should be All right, uh, I'd like to start off the presentation here with just some highlights that uh, we had for the year. First of all, we received a V-Safe grant for uh, $20,601.10. With that, we upgraded our pagers that we have that our volunteers keep and carry. And what that upgrade allowed us to do, or allowed especially more so them to do, is anytime radio channels change, they can listen to everything, which we would not have been able to do with the, the older style pagers. So we're able to get that. Uh, we were able to support 37 different town or community events. These were events that were not directly as a result of a call or did not have anything to do with fire prevention. This was just a variety of different things that we were kind of able to help contribute to. Uh, some very minor and some a little bit more involved. But, uh, we hold blood drive, six blood drives a year at the fire, I mean at fire department down in Leesville, and they were able to collect 196 units of blood. We also this year had seven members recognized by Lexington County EMS with life saving awards. What this award is, is awards that are given to members of the department who participate on a call or involved in a call where CPR was administered. The criteria for receiving that award is that the person walks out of the hospital with the same quality of life as they had before the event. So we did have seven members uh, Breaking out of that life saving award from Lexington County EMS this year. Uh, we were allowed to kind of get back in and do a little bit of fire prevention, not quite where we were before, but uh, we were able to get in, touch about 450 people with some fire prevention this year, which was up from the previous two years anyway because of the COVID stuff. Uh, just some highlights on some training here. Uh, we had one member certified as Firefighter One. That is a pretty big step that actually allows them. Uh, no restrictions, they can go interior if we need them to do that and kind of a big stepping stone for firefighter. We had four members nationally certified as uh, first responders. We had one member receive pump operations training and that is the last class that they have to take in the step before they can start driving and operating pumping vehicles on the department. So we did get one of those. We had one member certified as an EMT which is always good to have that little bit of extra knowledge there on scene with us. And one member certified in Fire Instructor 1, which will allow them to start assisting teaching classes and doing things here in town that kind of help keep the volunteer base up as much as we can. Our calls here is the breakdown of the calls for 2021. We ran a total of 1,052 calls this year. Just kind of a breakdown of percentage. Everything was pretty much percentage-wise about like it had been being for the past two or three years. The miscellaneous call section over there kind of went up a little bit, but uh, everything else was, was generically about the same percentage-wise. All right, here's the call volume over a 10-year time span. You can kind of tell where it went up. You can obviously see the dip there whenever COVID hit, and it kind of dipped down, and it is very much uh, on the... On, on the rise back up. So um, here this is the same breakdown you get in your monthly stats or every every month. This is just a five-year comparison side by side. These are actual numbers versus a percentage. And once again you can see that several of the columns there are a little bit elevated just by numbers, but we ran more calls, but like I said, percentage-wise everything was more or less the same. Alright, calls by month. Um, prior to this year, the most calls we had ever ran in a month was 103 calls. In August, we hit 107, which set, if you will, I guess a new high record call month. And that held up till January, whenever we, this past January, whenever we ran more than that. So, um, 
but pretty pretty busy year, pretty busy couple months there. Uh, response times, these are broken down by town, what we run in Lexington County, what we run in Saluda County. Our average overall response time is uh, seven minutes and one second. So no matter where we go on average, we, that's about where we, where we kind of get to uh, seven, 701. All right, call volume by area, two-thirds of our calls are here in town, and you've got the other third that's kind of outside of town. That's the breakdown from what we run in Lexington County with them and what we actually run in Saluda County. Obviously, Saluda County is a lot smaller percentage-wise, but that's kind of what our breakdown looks like as far as areas that we, we do run that we have contracted services with. All right, our average personnel per call. Here you can see it's kind of the same thing that uh, we mentioned last year. You can see our in-town structure fires, we did gain a person there on average for them. Our overall, as far as all calls, we did dip down a little bit more. Same thing as last year. I'm, I'm not saying that we can't handle a call if it comes in, but as a 10-year trend, it is kind of slowly dissipating and kind of slowly going down. Hopefully we can get that curve in turn, but it is that's just kind of what it looks like as a is a whole over a 10 year time span. All right, call volume peaks. This is just kind of an interesting way to look at it and usually I'll quiz the guys on when do you think the busiest call time was and usually everybody, well I don't say everybody, but a lot of them will kind of guess and it's usually not what you think. Uh, the busiest day for us to have a call was Friday closely followed by Monday and Tuesday and very generically Speaking between 8 in the morning and 8 at night is when we kind of keep the busiest times. So, not exactly when I would have thought, but it seems like we run a lot more at night, I guess, because you get woken up, but it's really, it's really not as much as we think there, but that's just kind of a breakdown of our call peaks. All right, a little bit of data that I kind of found interesting and intriguing there. Uh, we had our highest call volume on record this year, like I said, with 1,052. Prior to that, it was right around 950 calls, so we ran somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100 extra calls this year. I reached out to Lexington County Fire Service and got a breakdown of how many calls their stations had run per station, and we were busier than over half of the stations that they have in the county this year, so that, that one kind of surprised me a little bit too. I didn't think it'd be quite that high, but uh, so we were 57% busier, or we were busier than 57% of the, the stations. In the last six months of the year, I could not do the whole year just because we switched over software and the old software would not give me this data, or I couldn't get it to give it to me. We ran 88 overlapping calls. Now, overlapping means we were on one call when we get another call. That may overlap for a second, or it may overlap for the entirety, but at some point in time, it is overlapping. There, uh, we had 88 overlapping calls in the last six months, which is, is, I thought it was a pretty high number of trying to split resources to get to a couple, cover a couple different calls, and there were a few times when we would have three going at the time. So, uh, our average call length, uh, a little over 30 minutes, so every time we get a call, we're tied up for about 30 minutes there. On average, obviously, some are more than others. And this is some numbers that we pulled out of the bottom. Our total losses, uh, whenever we go to a call, we try to do the best we can to give an estimation of dollar loss and the total value of the property. These numbers come off of uh, what the county says the property is worth. Vehicles are like NADA value that you can kind of readily get off the internet. That's kind of where we get these numbers from. But total losses this year were a little over $250,000 and we saved around $2.8 million worth of property, or potentially saved that much. All right. That is all I have, unless y'all have any questions for me. Chief, thank you so much. Really appreciate all, all you do and the volunteers and everybody. So thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Luckadoo, the upcoming event. <coughs> Thank you. Um, upcoming events, the Town Egg Hunt, we have scheduled that for Wednesday, April 13th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at College Park. 
this will be the first egg hunt since April of 2019 due to COVID-19. So we're excited to bring this back and be able to offer this opportunity for the young kids in our community to come out and take part in the town egg hunt. Where is it? Uh, it? Uh, call, please call us off. Um, this will be spring break week for Lexington School District 3. Um, I know some people may be out of town for spring break, but we have found in the past that was a really good week to have this. We've also found that we have lots of people from outside of our community bring their kids in to take part in this town area. Uh, we will be hosting our second annual base release will spring clean event this year on Saturday, March 19th from 9 o'clock a.m. to 12 o'clock p.m. Uh, we will be reaching out to all the groups that took part in last year's event to join us again this year. Last year, we had over 260 people pick up over 5 tons or 10,000 pounds of trash in a three-hour time period. Uh, we hope that everyone that took part last year will, will consider taking part again this year. Um, this is a partnership event with Palmetto Pride, Keep the Midlands Beautiful, and Waste Management. This year's electronic recycling event will be held Saturday, April 23rd from 8 o'clock a.m. to 12 o'clock p.m. at, once again, the Baxter Louisville High School parking lot. We do appreciate the high school continuing to allow us to use that parking lot, which has served us well in the past. It's a nice big area. Uh, they will be accepting tires again this year, a limit of eight per person that comes. Scrap metal is what is their specialty item that they're taking in this year. I think last year were uh, worn shoes or, or shoes that were still in good shape. This year they're taking scrap metal. Uh, paper shredding will also be on site and electronics, of course, and they will accept up to eight electronic devices uh, that day. <clears throat> moving, up, moving on, uh, since last month's council meeting, we held the two public input sessions on both the downtown Batesburg and downtown Leesville Business District redevelopment. Uh, we had about 28 people attend the Batesburg session and about 35 attend the Leesville session. Um, there was great feedback from those that attended. Um, in follow-up to those sessions, we have since met with our engineers to discuss the feedback that was, that was brought up that night and um, the thoughts and, uh, and how do we uh, relate this towards them moving forward and, and incorporating the ideas and feedback into the design drawings that they're going to be doing. <clears throat> Alright, financials. Um, the total of all nine utility funds ended this mm -hmm. month at $1,613,929 with the major portion of that being our general fund checking account at $1,546,000. $651.98. Our total for all utility funds, uh, $3,416,148.49. Um, one thing that I would note in that number is, that, once again, is the 21, 2021 Infrastructure Revenue Bond Funds and the American Rescue Plan Funds are not calculated into that $3.4 million as they are separate. The hospitality tax checking account ended the month at $601,999.73, bringing the total of all funds in the bank outside of the rescue plan and infrastructure to $5,632,077.81. Uh, the next page, as I do each month, uh, from January 2015 to January month ending January of this year, you can see the side-by-side -side account balances for e each of the bank accounts that we have. And lastly, the general fund uh, operating revenues ended the month at 52%. We have brought in $2,437,423.33 today. And the operating expenses are currently at 63%. Um, at $2,942,229.02. For the utility fund, again, these numbers are, are much higher than normal. 
but a lot of this is due to the improvements at the wastewater plant and the money that's coming in and going out related to reimbursements and expenses for that. Uh, but our operating revenues, 83%, and operating expenses are 86%. <clears throat> Victims Assistance Fund, uh, operating revenues at $3,854 for 51%, and operating expenses are at 60% at $4,487, and the hospitality tax both revenue and expenses are at 66%, with revenues being $370,882.91 and operating expenses being $373,772.44. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, I have 11 executive session. We have one item this evening. is discussion of contractual matters relating to the water project. We have a motion to enter executive session. So uh, Mr. Prouse, it's second by Mr. Gambrero. Okay, thank you. Um, any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? 4? Yes. 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. And vote yes, we are in executive session. Amen. Regular session? So moved. Okay, Mr. Gambrero, who's my second? It was Jason. Sorry, Jason, Mr. Prime. Uh, any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? Yes. 3 votes yes. 4? Yes. 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. And may I vote yes? We have returned to regular session. Uh, possible actions by council and follow up to executive session. Mr. Mayor? Uh, Mr. Props, that's 4. I move that we. Uh, approve and accept the contract uh, from the Joint Municipal Water and Commission as presented to us in executive session. I have a motion by Mr. Proud to have a second. Yes. Second by Ms. Lemon. Any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. Does 3? Come back in? No, this is for contract. This is for the contract, sir. Oh, the District 3 votes no. 4? Yes. 5? Or 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. Oh, uh, well, yes. Motion passes. Um, I would be possible taken from the table. Uh, contract with Hazen and Sawyer Engineers. Do I have a motion? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Prouse. I move that we uh, remove from the table the contract with Hazen and Sawyer Engineers. I have a motion to remove from the table. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Wise. Any discussion? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Hall. Do we know if Hazen and Sawyer will be the engineering uh, services for Joint Mutual? They will. Any other discussion? To take it from the table. Okay, District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? District 3 votes yes. 4? Yes. 6? Yes. 7? Yes. 8? Yes. And I vote yes. Um, I see possible action relating to a contract with Hazen and Sword for preliminary design and water transmission, transmission system. Do I have a motion? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Prouse? I move that we accept the contract as presented from Hayden and Sawyer during the executive session. A motion to accept. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Wise, any discussion? District 1? Yes. 2? Yes. 3? This is to lift it from the table? No, no sir. We just, we just took it from the table. District 3 votes uh, no. District 4? Yes. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. 8? District 8? Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Motion passes. Um, item 13, potential agenda items for next month's meeting, March 14th, 2022. Do I have any motions? I have a question for our counselor. Do we need to put Shirley Street on, on back on the agenda? What's going on? I'm going out there this next week. I was supposed to go out there over the weekend, but I had some issues at my grandfather's farm with cows getting out and I didn't was, able, was not able to get out there but I'm going to go out there and meet with this bar and a neighbor mm -hmm. we're going to try to come out to the other street instead of coming all the way back out to Howard but that's going to take some help from the other neighbor okay well you bring that back if it is ready yes. thank you sir I'm driving a motion to adjourn so moved. Uh, Mr. Gambrell second second Mr. Prouse any discussion district one yes two yes three yes Four? Yes. Six? Yes. Seven? Yes. Eight? Yes.
And I vote yes. We are adjourned.